Nice story. Great but, story. But, but he, he, he ain't no Steph Curry. It's a problem. And talking all of that, you know, all that chatter about what he was doing to Steph yeah. Curry. Right. You know, I, I mean, for a guy that sat up there and picked Cleveland before the series began, I'm sitting there like this. Will you please be quiet? Stop talking about this, brother. This is a mistake because it's going to upset Steph Curry. Mm -hmm. Number three, I have to acknowledge to you that, you know, the absence of J.R. Smith, I mean, it has been so glaring. Uh, J.R. Smith is a guy that is supposed to be a talent, and he has been relegated to being nothing more than a shooter. And when his shot is not falling, there is nothing that goes right for him, and that's been the case. And then, of course, we look at David Blatt, some of the decisions that he's made. How does Timothy Moskov go from registering 28 and 10 in game four to playing nine minutes in game five? It makes absolutely no sense whatsoever, particularly when you consider the fact that even Mike Miller and James Jones played more minutes than your 7-1 center. Who's got some skills? I understand that Steve Kerr and the Golden State Warriors have been brilliant in terms of electing to go small. They've been playing small ball. We understand that. Their biggest play on the court at times has been Draymond Green. We get all of that. But at the same time, you can't run with them anyway. So why not try to change it up? Why not try to make them play your style by banging, getting physical, getting the ball inside and doing some damage? Unfortunately, that's not something they've elected to do. And that's why they find themselves down 3-2. It's a collection of things that are going on. It's not one thing, uh, but those are just some of them. You made a whole bunch of points. I'm going to leave the Mozgov point for a few minutes from sure. now. I'm going to go back to my takeaway from last night. Obviously, I picked Golden State to win this in seven games. Yep. And I thought last night was a very weird basketball game because I'm going to remind everyone, with four minutes and 24 seconds left in that game, LeBron James had a point-blank jumper over Iguodala, right in the lane, just point-blank, seven feet away, and it hit the back iron. If that goes in, it's 86 to 86. That's four minutes and 24 seconds left. LeBron had the pace in his favor. He had the, sco the low score in his favor, and it felt like to me, with 4.24 to go, LeBron had his team in perfect position to steal yet another game right. at Oracle. Right. And what happened from that point forward? Iguodala then goes down to the corner, the opposite corner, and hits a huge three-point shot. I, I thought that was the biggest shot of the game. Then LeBron doesn't box out on the next possession, and Iguodala gets an easy putback. All of a sudden, it's a five-point game. It wasn't until that point that Steph, who again is my favorite player in the league, went absolutely nuts on Delhi. But it's a seven-point game at that point. And by the way, Delhi did, I, I don't know how you could play better defense than he did on Steph on every shot that Steph made. I thought Delhi mirrored him at the best he could play, got a hand in his face. When Steph is on, Steph is absolutely unstoppable. And when he found it last night, late, now they're all burial type points because it's already a seven point game that goes to a ten point game and he scores those last ten points. And all of a sudden, very misleadingly, that game turns into a 13 point, what felt like a blowout at the end and again 424 left it was a close game so my my point is the Cavs broke down allowed three straight offensive rebounds in that stretch which is unlike them because that's what they usually do to the other team that was uncharacteristic to me so my point is as Cleveland goes home I think Cleveland still has a lot of confidence it can win game six and get it back here I, I do think they do because Hey, you, you had them right where you wanted them last night. Am I right? Yeah, that you're absolutely right. But what I'm trying to say to you is that, it, to me, yes, they do have the confidence to win Game Six, and that's a story. That's a, that's a subject Will broaches the show progresses today. But what you have to understand is that if you're Cleveland, you're almost better off getting blown out and losing. I'll give you a perfect example. When San Antonio, your San Antonio Spurs lost the finals two years ago, mm. they were up 3-2. To they were up 3-2. They go into Miami. They try to close Miami out. And you know the fatal play. Chris Bosh grabs a rebound off the LeBron miss, feeds Ray Allen. Ray Allen hits it from the right corner, you know, over time, blah, blah, blah. What I'm saying to you is that one of the reasons why so many folks were confident 
that San Antonio would lose game seven is because, figuratively speaking, they had emptied the chamber. Now, obviously, they didn't because they competed in that game, too, in game seven and had and had Tim Duncan hit a shot in the lane, a hook in the lane. You know, the very one well may have been a different story. There is something to be said for things like that. When you look at Golden State and Cleveland, Cleveland is at a point right now where the more minutes they play, the more trouble they're in because the mentality that Golden State has is stay the course, stay the course, stay the course. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. You hear Draymond Green, you hear Andre Iguodala, you hear Steph Curry and everybody talking about how you can't prioritize locking down LeBron because you're not going to be able to do it. Where other players, you might make adjustments, make changes and say, all right, he's getting off in the first quarter. We've got to do something about it. Their attitude is we know we're not going to be able to do anything but so, uh, but so much anyway about LeBron. Uh, all we can do is stay the course and wear him down. So my point to you is that I look at last night's game, and to me, Cleveland, in terms of the series, would have been better off getting blown out where you say, all right, it's the third quarter. This is over. Mm. Sit down. We lost this. We'll see y'all Tuesday. The fact that they were in it as the game was winding down, you're expending energy from a team that's almost running on empty, and that's where your problem lies. I have no doubt that... In all likelihood, Cleveland could turn around and win game six. But the problem with Golden State is Golden State strategy this entire series has been about the marathon, the long stretch. As the game and the series wanes, we will gain the advantage because they don't have the bodies to deal with us. And Cleveland showed that yet again last night because everything was going just according to plan. And then the last four minutes, they faded. They faded. That's they your fell problem apart. in okay. this series. And that's why they're in trouble. <sighs> okay, back to your J.R. Smith point. This man does have talent. And yes. it is explosive talent. And yeah. we saw it early. Mm-hmm. At one point, he'd made, he, he obviously had a hot stretch, but he had four out of his first eight shots. Right. And then all of a sudden, he disappears. Whose fault is that? Because they don't run plays for him. It wasn't until late in the game he had two force-up threes that he missed. But but I thought he just faded from the offense. I was surprised they didn't feed the hot hand faster than they did because off his hot stretch, there was five minutes that elapsed before he even got another shot. So he's not featured in the offense at all. It has to come on the fly. That's fair, and that's a coaching issue, no question. But... I am not letting J.R. Smith off the hook, and I'm going to tell you why, the biggest reason why. The Golden State Warriors have been the absolute worst nightmare for J.R. Smith's game. Here's why. Because the talent that they have really evolves on on perimeter players. Even the bigs, the so-called bigs they have outside of Andrew Bogut, okay, the so-called bigs they have have perimeter skills. Mm-hmm. What happens is is that they are showing JR how you're supposed to play. Clay Thompson. Clay Thompson's averaging 18 points this series. We know that he hasn't been a story even though he exploded for 34 in game two. But do you watch Steph Curry, I'm sorry, Clay Thompson play? He's going to hit open shots. But if he's not hitting open shots, he might miss some. But he's creating space, getting his shot off. More importantly, he's causing problems because he's constantly in motion. He's cutting to the basket. He's getting fouled. Or he's distracting defenders away from a Steph Curry or away from a Draymond Green or away from an Andre Iguodala because of his movement without the basketball. All you kids out there who aspire to play basketball understand you don't just stand around and get the ball and go one on one. You can you they want you to have the ability to do that because things break down and if you have those kind of elite skills that's better for you. But when you're playing within the confines of a structured basketball game, there is movement, there is spacing, and Clay Thompson knows how to do these things. J.R. Smith has been exposed as an individual who has talent, who can take you one on one sometimes, whose handle isn't great. But he can shoot and he can hit big shots and contest the shots. The problem is there's more to NBA basketball than just spotting up and shooting. If J.R. Smith 
moved without the basketball. The way that Klay Thompson mm-hmm. moves without the basketball. J.R. Smith could go to the free throw line, y'all. He could score from the free throw line. If he got there, he never gets there. You know why? Because J.R. Smith is busy jacking up shots. Mm. That's it. And, and what I'm saying to you is that you have to be able to know how to move without the basketball. And the crime and all of that, he's been in the league long enough. He's supposed to know better. And I'm looking at other guards that are doing the kind of things that J.R. Smith has the ability to do. If he used this more no, I know. and moved without I, the basketball, J.R. Smith, the Cleveland Cavaliers would be in a better position because he would be more productive. And that's the difference. Klay Thompson is playing the way J.R. Smith is supposed to be playing, but J.R. Smith doesn't use this the way Klay Thompson does. LeBron has to use this for J.R. LeBron has to feature J.R. more in the offense. And now let's move to your Mozgov point. Yep. I heard you say this on Sports Center last night, and I wanted to throw something at the TV because I disagreed with you, sure. but I knew I was going to get a shot at you yeah. here at 10 o'clock. Yeah. Okay. Sure. 7 okay. O'clock Under- here. Understandable. Yes. Don't let him throw nothing at me. Yeah. I won't. I won't. Okay. I won't. He's protect. I act, silly me, I actually liked it that David Blatt decided to yank Mozgov from that game. Because what happened when Mozgov went 28 and 10 in game four back in Cleveland? Mm-hmm. They lost by 21 points. Mm-hmm. And I loved it because yanking Mozgov kept that guy you just sarcastically referred to, Andrew Bogut, uh-huh. kept him on the bench the whole game. I'm so surprised. He, he is one of the best rim protectors in this game. He is one of the best. And LeBron James got to play all four quarters with no real rim protector unless you include Draymond in that. Okay. But but again, LeBron James, for just about the whole game, really the whole game, he was the biggest and strongest player on the court. Seriously, when you think about it, who, who did Golden State have on the floor without Bogut? I know Festus played a little bit. Three but, minutes and 12 yeah, seconds. Okay, so, so I'm not even going to count that. So LeBron James had his way. The lane should have belonged to him all night. Again, he put up huge numbers, but I'm saying it's really advantage LeBron. When you don't have any Bogut in there, all of a sudden it's just... Draymond has to come off his guy 